Hey, what's up guys? It is Saikiru Sam here and welcome back to the channel and today in this video we're going to be starting up a brand new series on the channel called Making Mobile Games with Saiku or something like that. It's going to be made in Unity and if you guys want to see obviously like some tutorials in UE4 definitely let me know in the comments and we can make it. Um, but anyway in this video specifically we're going to create a game that is similar to a mobile game that I recently downloaded which is also called Chili Snow. So we're going to create something that is similar to that game and see how it ends up if you guys enjoy make sure to hit the thumbs up button down below it really shows a lot of support on these new series so that i know what you what kind of content you guys obviously want to see and uh, let us know in the comments if you have any questions and if you want to stick around for more videos subscribe and with that being said let's get right into this and um, we can actually start off by creating a plane here as you can see this is a brand new project by the way i created it in um 2d preset I guess you could say as you can see we have the 2d tile set and, and all that uh, going on right here so uh, there's nothing really like that specific about this right now we just have it kind of like that um, we can also add a I just add a plane into our scene I can also add a camera there we go let's make the uh, position 0 0 0 on all axis and we can do that the same thing to our plane as well to ensure that it's you know centered aligned with the scene uh, or with the camera perhaps you could say and there we go um, as you can see the plane is not visible right now and it's because the plane is kind of rotated towards um, like the edge of the plane is actually where the camera begins looking at so if we rotate it like this you're gonna be able to see it now uh, you can't see it in the game view because we don't we haven't yet moved it to the uh, a little bit back so we can do like this uh, actually we can go to the 3d view for this real simple there we go uh, I think that's enough. Maybe a little bit further. I don't know. Yeah, that should be good. Uh, we don't really want it to be way too far away because we obviously are creating a top-down game, uh, which we are going to have the camera over the player. So next up, we are actually going to make sure that it's perfectly aligned in terms of rotation. So as you can see, I just kind of like summed up the number to be minus 90 instead. If you make this positive 90, it's going to be turned around the other way and it's not going to be visible because it's not double shader, double sided shader. There we go. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Now I am also going to resize this quite a bit to ensure that it's, you know, filling up a big chunk of the, uh, of the camera and also of the scene itself so that we can actually see kind of where we are. Um, I can also make it wider like this. There we go. I think that should be enough. Yeah, let's keep it like this. Um, honestly, speaking of which, this is a mobile game, so we could have it like this, so that we have a little bit of edge, and maybe we can add like a skybox or something like that, so it can be pretty cool. Let's leave it like that for now. Uh, I'm going to rename this to ground. There we go. Um, let's see here. We can also add a directional light to our scene. There we go. And we can kind of rotate it a little bit so that we have it a little bit brighter here. Um, yeah, that should be enough. I will also add soft shadows to this. And next thing next, I want to actually create... Yeah, you know what? We can actually rotate it a little bit more. Like that. Uh, so that be, Because when we have our obstacles and we, when we have our player, obviously we want to be able to see the shadows. So I just rotate it a little bit. Um, now you can see that it's quite glossy in the uh, the material itself for the ground is very very glossy So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a new folder color materials and Inside of this folder, we're gonna create a brand new material and we can call this ground Then we just drag and drop it onto our ground and now we're gonna edit the values for this so we could just decrease the smoothness completely uh, if you want to you can also make it metallic, but I'm gonna keep it like this perhaps uh, maybe like this. Yeah, that should be good enough um, Then we are actually going to add our player for the player though I am just going to use a little sphere which should be good enough if we want to edit that out later Obviously we can come back to it, but it's very easy if you, in case you want to do it Obviously you just change out the model um, the script is just going to be the same which I am going to show to you guys as well further in this video So don't worry about that There we go. Uh, we can have it like that just kind of aligned. There we go. Uh, let's see if we can rotate the duration light a little bit. 
There we go. I think that looks pretty good. Um, we can also change it back from being such metallic so that we kind of have it grayed out, like not completely white, but I don't want it to be way too dark either. Um, inside of our materials folder, I'm also going to create another material and we can call this one player. There we go. We can drag it to our player, which is the sphere. Uh, speaking of which, we can actually rename the sphere to player. And we can also tag it as player to, um, to kind of just ensure that we have everything done here. And now for the material player, we're going to go back to it and we're going to change the color. And maybe I want to go with something like a little bit green-ish. There we go. Um, I could also make the smoothness completely down. Yeah, let's do that. Um, I'm not going to play with the metallic value. Yeah, I don't really need that. Uh, let's see. We could actually also have it like... Uh, I don't know. I don't know about this. I, I don't think that I want to go with that material, but for now, let's give it like this. Uh, if we obviously want to change it up, we can come back to it later. So, um, now what I want to do is I simply want to add a trigger object that is going to be the one that the player collides with and which is going to result in creating another plane right below this plane. I'm going to show you guys how to do it by code. It's very simple, actually. A lot of people make it very difficult for uh, creating kind of like infinite runners. Uh, it's not that difficult, actually. So I'm just going to increase the size quite a bit of this cube. Uh, there we go. Yeah, that should be enough. Just make sure that it's, you know, to every, like, it's long enough or wide enough to reach every edge of the uh, of the plane so that we don't um, kind of bug it out, you know? So there we go. I can have it kind of like here, I guess. And we could also call this trigger um, or maybe spawn trigger. There we go, because it's going to spawn the next plane in our, in our queue. So um, yeah, we could use that name. Um, we could also make it a child of the ground and we can create another folder here. Oh, I want to do that in the assets folder. There we go. So we create another folder called as prefabs. We can go inside of it and drop our ground, which also includes the spawn trigger now. There we go. Um, now I want to go to the spawn trigger or actually perhaps we can create another folder for this uh, because we're going to get into scripting now. So we can name this folder scripts and as you can see I accidentally created it inside of prefabs folder so I can just drag it to assets and boom, here we go. So inside of this folder we are going to create our first C-sharp script for this tutorial and we can name it um, spawn ground pretty much. I think it's a very very bad name but... <laughs> I mean, it's fine. I It's fine. You you kind of at least understand what it means or what it stands for. So it should be fine. Uh, as a daily routine, I just removed these two. There we go. And we're going to recreate them because obviously we are being very, very uh, useless. <laughs> no, we're not being useless. It's just something that I usually do. Um, first, and, first and foremost, we can create a couple of variables. Call this one public game object track which is going to be the object itself for the plane or the ground that we're going to spawn. And we can also have a public boolean that is going to be called spawned. And this is going to be a boolean where we, which we use in order to check if the plane has already spawned or the ground or the track or whatever you want to name it. And in case it has, you know, we're not going to spawn it once again because we obviously don't want to bug out the game and spawn multiple planes over and over again. So we just kind of make sure that that's not the case. Um, now, this script is going to be very short, actually. We can just say void on trigger enter collider other. There we go. Uh, move it down a little bit. And in here, in the void, we are going to say if other the tag equal to player. And this simply means that the void itself is literally saying when we when this object triggers with another object, with another collider, specifically with the parameter that we're adding here. Uh, then we are checking if the other game object that is triggering with this object is has the tag of player, then we're going to do something specific. 
if the game object has something else, a another tag other than player, obviously we're just gonna ignore the trigger itself. So you're just gonna continue with your day. Um, but if it is the player, then we are going to make sure that we spawn the next plane, which is going to be underneath this ground that is current. So we're pretty much going to first and foremost create a vector three. So we can say vector three position, or perhaps just pause, which is a shortening for or a shortened version of position. And then we can say equal to new vector three, which is going to be equal to transform dot parent uh, dot position dot x, which means that we are setting the x value of this this position that we are setting for the the spawn to be the parents x kind of value, so that we you know align it in the x uh, alignment or the x kind of axis. I'm gonna show it to you guys visually in just a bit as well, but. For now, we are going to say that, then comma, and then we're gonna say inside of parentheses, we can actually say transform dot parent dot position dot y. So pretty much the same thing, but for the y axis. And then for a difference, we are going to say minus, uh, perhaps we can say 25f. 25 might be too much. We can come back to this later to change it up. But for now, we're gonna keep it at 25f. And then we're gonna end the parentheses here. Uh, then we're gonna set another comma and say transform dot parent dot position dot c. There we go. And then we're gonna end the entire parentheses. So, oh, I spelled it wrong here. Uh, there we go. All right. So basically, we are setting a new vector three, which means a space in the world in our three D world, uh, which is gonna be called position or pause, like I said before, um, which is going to be simply a new vector three that we're setting. And it's gonna have the x value of the the parent of this object that we have created, which is the trigger object. And if you guys remember, we made the trigger object a child of the plane itself, the ground itself, right? So what we're saying here is when we trigger the player with this game object, then we are going to set the position to be the parent's position x because we want it to be aligned in the x axis so that it doesn't move left or right, right? So we set that. And then we set the y value to be uh, pretty much the same with this, but we are setting it to be a little bit below by setting it to minus 25f. And that's why I use the parentheses as well. And then the same with the z axis, we just say basically we are going to keep it aligned so that it doesn't move up or down or uh, maybe in the depth value, like it doesn't, you know, happen to be underneath this object. So after this, we're actually going to say transform uh, transform dot parent dot position. Oh no no no! Sorry, I am completely lost here. We are just going to instantiate it instead. So we're gonna say instantiate track dot transform, um, which is going to instantiate the track itself, which is the ground that we're gonna obviously spawn underneath this one. Uh, and then we're gonna say comma pause. So which means the position that we just recently created. And we are also going to set the the position of the spawned object, the, the new plane that we're spawning to be the same as this one. So we're gonna say transform.parent.rotation. Very, very basic here. Um, and then we're gonna set the spawned boolean to be true. And also one more thing before we forget, uh, in the if statement itself, where we check if other.tag equal to player, we're also gonna say and exclamation mark spawned, which means that spawned is false. And we want to do this because once again, we don't want it to bug out. So we're basically saying if the if the game object that is triggering this object is called player or has a type player and the spawned value is false, which means that the next plane in our queue has not spawned yet, we are going to obviously call this spawn the plane and set it to be spawned equal to true so that it doesn't bug out. So that's pretty much it for the script. Um, now we can in fact go back to Unity and let's see here, we can go to our spawn trigger object and we're gonna edit a few values. In fact, we haven't even added the components, so we're gonna do that first and foremost. There we go. And now we're gonna go to our prefabs folder here and drag and drop the ground into our track because that is obviously the ground that we're gonna spawn. So we're not gonna play with the spawn the boolean. Don't uh, press in this and you can even make it a private boolean instead of public boolean I don't know why I kept it as public, but it doesn't really matter as long as you don't check it. It's fine It's gonna work. Uh, so yeah, let's let's try this out and see how it goes um, Actually before we do get into game 
I want to add, I could actually, instead of adding a new box collider, we can just make this one is trigger. So check this button, then we can fold this and we can go to our player and we can add a rigid body. Uh, there we go. And we're going to disable use gravity, enable is kinematic. We're not going to use gravity because we don't want our player to kind of like fall through all these objects in case we trigger with a obstacle and all that. If you want to, you can enable the gravity. It doesn't really matter that much, but for security purposes, I'm just not going to do that right now. Then we're going to add a sphere collider, one more sphere collider, in fact, uh, to our or maybe we could actually remove this and just edit this. So we set the is trigger to be true and yeah, let's keep the radius. It doesn't really matter. Uh, let's just check is trigger to ensure that, you know, the, the object can walk through this. So uh, when we're playing the game, we are just going to drag it in here. Um, you can see that the ground is spawning here, which is perfectly fine, but it's not spawning perfectly aligned. So, like I said, we're going to edit the value in our code again, which is the 25F that we set earlier. So, instead of 25, maybe 20. Could be pretty good. Uh, could be worth trying. Let's see if that works better. So, we just play the game again, kind of just... And you guys have to, like, find the value that works perfectly fine with your game. As you can see, the 20 was perfect for me. So, depending on the height you have for your plane, Obviously, it's going to change a little bit, so make sure that you just find the value that fits perfectly for your game. Um, so 24 works for me. I'm going to keep it like that, which is perfect. Now, I want to drag and drop the ground from our hierarchy into the ground that is inside of our prefabs folder. The reason I'm doing this is to overwrite the old ground, which didn't even have the component before we created it. So obviously, as you guys saw, we created the component inside of our scripts folder, the c -sharp script itself, and then we dragged it onto our play or the ground uh, in the hierarchy. So we just overwrite so that this one, uh, the prefab itself gets all the values. And it's important because we are obviously spawning this. So in case we didn't do that, we would be able to spawn one ground, which was this one, which is a preset, and then it wouldn't be spawning anymore. Um, so now it's going to work with that. So next up, we actually want to create the random obstacle spawning. So we're going to go ahead and uh, create a new C -sharp script inside of our scripts folder. And we can perhaps call this obstacle spawning. Yeah, pretty good name. Um, in fact, I am going to have this as a script of our ground. Maybe we can change the 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 parent of that script later but for now we're going to keep it as ground and inside of the script it's actually going to be quite straightforward so i'm going to teach you guys how to do this uh, first and foremost let us get the game object called player so we just say public game object player uh, because we're going to use our player's transform position later which i'm going to show you guys and then we're also going to have a public game object obstacle which is going to be the obstacle itself that we're going to spawn. Um, and then we are also going to have a public float amount of obstacles, which is going to be the amount of obstacles you can spawn with this ground so that we you know, don't spawn infinitely or way too little. So you can edit that through your inspector very easily. Uh, and last but not least, we're also going to have a public float and we're going to name one variable called minimum x and then comma maximum x. And what this is, is basically we are going to set a kind of like constraint or a limit for the x axis where you can spawn the object and you cannot spawn the object so that it doesn't spread out into the entire world because we wouldn't even be able to see any kind of obstacle in that case, which we don't want, obviously. So, and oh, I just removed that. <laughs> there we go. And if you guys didn't know, this is a little bit of basic C Sharp 2. Uh, if you didn't know, you can simply say public float and then one variable and then boom, comma and another variable. So the reason you do like you can only do this if you're creating two different floats. Uh, and I'm doing this because obviously these are going to be used in the same kind of reference or same kind of part of the code. So I just do this to keep it a little bit more clean. And if you're that kind of optimization guy, yes, you do save a little bit of memory, <laughs> but it's not very, very important. So yeah, uh, we can go ahead and create a, a public void start. There we go. And we're going to have a for loop inside of this. So we're going to say for int i equal to zero. 
I lower the amount of obstacles, I++. plus plus. So if you guys didn't know, or if you don't know how for loops work, it's pretty much like this. So you're basically saying for, we are creating a integer, which is going to be called I in this case. And we are also setting it to be zero by default as soon as the game starts. And then as long as I is lower than a number, which is in this case, a variable that we set here, which we're gonna change from the inspector, then we are going to plus I by itself, which means that everything we put inside of these two brackets here is going to be ran the amount of times I pluses itself. So basically the amount of times or the, the number you have here is, the, is going to be the amount of times this for loop is going to run. And we're going to use this in order to uh, spawn all the objects by themselves independently. So speaking of which, we are going to set another vector 3 here to start off with. And we're going to say, we can name it pause 2. It's a pretty good name. And then we're going to say equal to new vector 3. And inside of parentheses, we're now going to get a little bit more advanced here. So we are going to say random dot range and then parentheses minimum x minimum y or minimum minimum x maximum y uh, maximum x there we go <laughs> i don't know why i made it so difficult for myself so we were pretty much saying we are going to set a random value here a random float between this and this and then we're going to say comma um after the end of that parentheses obviously we're going to have another random range so we're going to say random dot range another parentheses and this one is going to be for testing purposes we're going to set it to be player dot transform dot local position uh did i spell it right yeah i did dot y because this is going to be the y axis and then uh we are also going to say comma transform dot local position dot y times two we're going to test this out we're going to test it out and after that parenthesis ends, we are going to set another comma and just say zero, which is going to be the Z axis. There we go. Uh, this looks long and I know it's long and it looks scary. It looks intimidating, but it's literally the same as creating a new vector three, uh, which is going to be zero, 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 literally the same. We are basically setting the first zero to be equal to random dot range, uh, which is going to be a random float between this float, which is a variable, and this float, which is also a variable. And then we're setting the second z uh, zero here, which is the y axis, to be another random range, which is going to be between this float value, which is going to be the player's local position in our world, but the y axis only, because obviously we're playing only with the y axis right now. And we are also going to randomize it from starting from this value until it reaches the transform local position Y, which is going to be this ground objects local position, but in Y axis. And we're uh, pretty much just kind of multiplying it by two uh, for testing purposes. We're just going to see how that works in case we're not happy with the number. If, if something breaks in the game while spawning these, we're going to change that to, to another number, or maybe we can just remove it completely. But for now, we're going to keep it. And this third zero, as you can see, it's the same, which is the Z axis. And we're not changing it because we want it to be uh, aligned in the Z alignment or the Z axis. So we just don't play with that value at all. Um, but that's pretty much it. Like, don't be intimidated because it looks long. It's literally just that we are randomizing one number or one float, we are randomizing the second float, which is the long part, actually, I just realized. And then we're just setting it to be zero, the third value itself. So after that, we are going to say, uh, we could, yeah, we don't really, we just instantiate this. So we can say instantiate obstacle.transform, which is the, the obstacle variable that we created earlier. Then we're going to set the position of this spawning object to be equal to pause, which is the position vector three, the long variable here that we created. And we are also going to say quaternion dot identity to set the rotation to be by default, kind of just default rotation, literally. Um, all right. So we're going to save the script, go back to unity. We can play the game uh, or 
Yeah, there we go. Okay. So before we do play the game, I want to go to our prefabs folder and one more time we want to overwrite the current ground by the ground that we have in the hierarchy. So just drag and drop the one in the hierarchy onto your ground here in the prefabs folder. The reason, once again, because we want to update all the components that have been added specifically to this spawn trigger. So, uh, oh no, not spawn trigger, sorry, the ground itself. There we go. And we're actually going to have to do that one more time. But before we do, we are going to drag and drop the player into our player field here, the player slot. The obstacle is going to be, yeah, in fact, we're going to have to create an obstacle right now. So we're going to go ahead here. Create another, perhaps this can be a cube, you know, we can have it as a cube for the, for now. Uh, we can change it up later if we want to. There we go. It's kind of aligned with the, with the ground. There we go. We can also name this obstacle, in fact. Alright. And we can, um, yeah, we can drag and drop this into our prefabs folder. And let's see, let's see. Mm, we could go to ground and just drag and drop the obstacle prefab into this the obstacle field that we created and amount of obstacles that we're gonna spawn let's say 20 to start off with because they are pretty small um, in fact I can also delete the obstacle that we created in the scene but not the prefab so that we have it saved as a prefab um, minimum X this is a value you're gonna have to play around with once again but Let's say minus five to five uh, until we reach that number. So let's go ahead and play the game now. Uh, or yeah, let's overwrite the ground one more time and then play the game. Let's see how this works. So it's spawning. Yeah, it's spawning in a. Oh, I see why it's doing that. I see, I see. Uh, we, for some reason, we have moved the plane and all the other components to be at Y, or does that axis to be at 11, 10, or something like that. So we're gonna do like this. We're gonna set the player and ground and spawn trigger to be Z axis zero. There we go. Now we are also going to move the camera a little bit back, maybe like this, and have it aligned with the player like that. There we go. And we can actually move up the player a little bit. There we go. So that we can see, you know, a little bit down below the map too, so that we see where the objects spawn. Um, we could also move, or not like that. There, uh, there we go. <laughs> so we can move down this, so that we have it down below, so that we can play like in this field quite freely. Um, and let's see why. I forgot to do one certain thing, I feel like. Or did I? Let's play and see how it works. Yeah, it's working. Uh, however, we're gonna have to play with the values a little bit. All right, I came up with a better idea on how to actually do this. So what we're gonna do is we are, I'm actually gonna make the code a little bit easier for you guys. So you don't have to really do this if you don't want to. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create two floats uh, which is going to be one is going to be called float um, Yeah, we can just say kind of like X axis Yeah, and then one is going to be called Y axis All right, and now we are going to say that X axis is going to be equal to random dot range Which is going to be minimum X maximum X There we go a6 <laughs> X axis there we go. I'm just gonna make the code a little bit easier for you guys. Um, and then y axis is going to be equal to random dot range, uh, whatever is in here, right? There we go. So we just copy that. Parentheses. Boom. That's it. So what we can do here, we can now remove these two first lines, and we can just say x axis, y axis. And then zero. Boom. That's a lot easier for you guys. I think that's going to help you understand it a little bit better. And I also came up with a solution to this part. Uh, I just wanted to copy paste so that I don't make multiple changes at the same time, like simultaneously for you guys. So what we're going to do, instead of saying this, we're going to remove this line or this little parameter inside of the parentheses itself. And we are instead going to say player dot transform, uh, transform, there we go, local position dot y minus 20 
all right? And we are also gonna set a comma and say player.transform.localPosition.y, so the same thing, but this time minus 50, all right? And before we continue, I also wanna make a little change here. So we are going to say uh, player equal to game object dot find with tag player. The reason I'm doing this is to find the player object because you can't you can't go to the ground and like attach the player because it's a prefab and you're trying to attach something in a hierarchy which is not consistent. So you can't do this. So we're instead just making a workaround and finding the player upon start of the game or start of the script itself. That's what public void start does. And now for this change, we're basically going to say that every time we are spawning these obstacles, the minimum Y axis is going to be set to whatever position the player is in right now in the Y axis, minus 20, so 20 units below the player and maximum by 50 units uh, below the player. And this is going to result in the obstacle spawning a little bit below the player, like extra below, so that we don't see, or else like it was, I can actually play the game and uh, show it to you guys. I think it's gonna be a lot easier to understand. As you can see, they are now spawning here instead of here, so that we have a little bit of like starting sequence for the player. It's like, get ready, and then boom. The player gets ready, you know, he triggers what this, boom the obstacles are already here. And when he triggers with this one, the first one, the trigger itself, the ones that are below this are spawned. As you can see, they are spawned here. And when we trigger with this one, instead of spawning them here in real time so that the player sees them, you know, it becomes a little bit unrealistic, we just spawn them on the platform below. And that's what we did with the values here. So one more little change I wanna do before getting into the player uh, is actually, increasing the width of the ground a little bit. However, this is gonna increase the width of the trigger itself, but I don't think that it matters that much. I honestly don't. So let's do that. And the reason I'm doing this is because otherwise it just kind of becomes like, um, as you saw, like if we went down with the player, when we were here, you were able to see here, which, which still is visible. So we're gonna increase it even a little bit more. Um, or else we can just move this up a little bit. There we go. And we can also increase the height once again. There we go. And we just move this up a little bit. There we go. Uh, that should be pretty good. So now we play. Boom. A new instance is started. And we just continue like this. They are going to spawn, you know, randomly. They are going to spawn sometimes in chunks because we don't set like an offset, which is, I, in my opinion, it's fine because it's making the game more challenging so that you don't, you know, have the same kind of layout every single time you play. We are finally gonna get into the final part of this video or of this tutorial, which is the player. So inside of our scripts folder, we're gonna create a player script called, uh, we can call it player to make it easy. And we can also drag and drop it onto our player. There we go. And we can open it up in Visual Studio. And as usual, as per usual, we just remove these two boys. And we do that. There we go. Um, now we're gonna create a score for the player. So we can have a public float score. Or maybe even a private float. Because this is not gonna, this is not needed to be uh, public. Because obviously we don't really need it to be public in the first place since we're not gonna change it from the inspector. And we're also gonna have another one, but this one is going to be a public float, and this is gonna be called movement speed, which is going to be the value that we use in order to control the movement speed of our player. Um, and now we can actually say void start. Maybe make a little bit of space there. And we can also have a void update. There we go. And upon starting the game every time, we are going to set the score to be zero to make sure that we start from zero. Um, and instead of our void update, we are actually going to say score plus equal time dot delta time, which is going to increase score by one every second. And we are also gonna move the player forward, which we are going to do by saying transform dot translate vector three dot forward times time dot delta time times movement speed. 
This means that we are going to um, translate, which also means that we are going to move this object that the script is attached to by a uh, vector 3 forward, which we're going to try. If it doesn't work, we're going to change this to another direction because the game is in 2D and I'm unsure which direction we're actually going to move it forward. Um, and then we are saying we're going to do this every second and we're going to set the, the speed itself to be by movement speed. So we can go back to Unity and let the player script load. There we go. And we're going to change up the movement speed to kind of like maybe 10. We'll see how that goes. If it's way too much, we're going to decrease. We can play the game now and see. Yeah, okay, so movement forward goes there. So I would suppose this is down then. There we go. So we just change it to vector, th vector 3 down and play the game once again and let's see how this goes. There we go. Alright, cool. 10 is actually pretty good. I, I like the, uh, the value of 10 right there. So to make it a little bit more fun, we can actually add a trail renderer to our player. Uh, to match it with the game that we are actually taking inspiration of and inside of our materials folder We can create a new material or Or we could just use the player material for the trail um, So uh, just kind of like unfold materials here is gonna be like this So just click on the arrow and set the size to be one and then drag and drop the player material into the none field Which is going to change up to player um, We can also yeah, let's use a curve. Let's say that width is going to be 0.5. Oh wait, actually we can do like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we set it to 0.5 so that we have a little bit better options in the width section here. So we set the starting width to be like 0.1 and then we double click where it says 0.5 and just kind of move it here. There we go. Um, this is going to make so that the width is 0.1 at start, so that it's very small from the beginning, but then it kind of like increases, uh, which we're going to see now. There we go, as you can see. All right, so one more change that I want to do, or a little tweak, is to remove the mesh renderer from our spawn trigger object, and then replace the ground inside of our prefab folder with the ground from our hierarchy to make sure that it's updated with the with the spawn trigger mesh render being disabled. So this is going to result in us not seeing the, the spawn trigger every single time. Uh, there we go. Oh, the trail render is a little bit weird. It's kind of like losing its color. Might be that it's in trigger with this. Let's see if that works. Oh yeah, there we go. Uh, that's a lot better actually. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, we can increase the width of the the um what's it called the uh trail itself a lot earlier in fact that's very early though let's make it like almost half a little bit above half like that yeah that's actually better you can see like a difference at least um we could also decrease the time to be two seconds so that it doesn't, you know, become way too far too long, so that it kind of falls down after two seconds. Yeah, that's actually pretty good. Um, now we're gonna open up Visual Studio once again, and we can throw in the comments saying player movement, and we are going to, um, yeah, we can actually have a boolean here called private boo moving left. All right, and. From start of the game, yeah, from start of the game, we are going to say moving left equal to true. And we're going to say if input dot get mouse button down zero in the void update, moving left equal to uh, equal or the, um, the exclamation mark moving left. There we go. So this is going to switch every time we click on the screen. It's pretty much going to switch moving left to be from true to false. In case it's true, it's going to become false. In case it's false, it's going to be true and so on. So we can now, uh, oh yeah, we actually have to make sure that it's moving left and right too. So if we say, mm, we can just say if moving left, then transform the rotate. 
Yeah, we can just kind of transform that rotate pretty much like zero. Uh, or hold on, are we going to rotate in X axis? I think so. We could test by 10, zero, zero. There we go. And else transform dot rotate. Um, yeah, we actually want to change it up a little bit here, but we're going to test this out. So we can say minus 10, zero, zero. Let's first and foremost make sure that the axes are, are, are correct so that we uh, don't play around with the different axes. So let's play the game. Yeah, this is really wrong. <laughs> Quite clearly, it was the wrong axis, all right? Uh, we can set that to be zero. And let's say that we are going to change 10 to this. And let's try the game again. Like I said, I just want to find the correct axis to play with. Okay, so it's Z axis. Quite easily uh, learning that. We can set it to be one, or else it's going to be way too drastic. And we can set this to be zero and minus one instead. There we go. Let's see if that's correct with the minus, or else we might have to change it up a little bit. There we go. All right, that's actually pretty cool. Uh, I like this. I like it a lot. I, I didn't mean even to have like the camera rotation from the beginning. I didn't want the camera to rotate, but it's kind of like, it's kind of mesmerizing to look at now that I have it like that. <laughs> I really like this obstacle spawn, like it's spawning in chunks. I prefer this over having it laid out very like perfectly, right? Uh, maybe, maybe one is way too much though. Let's have it like 0.5f. And also here, so 0.5f, there we go. Like in the game that we were taking inspiration of, when you hold down the screen, it's going to move you a little bit more drastically. So we can do that kind of effect in here too. And we could say a new private float here and call it um, rotation speed. There we go. So if we say we get mouse button down zero, then we are going to set the rotation speed to be 0.5f. And we can change this from 0.5f to be rotation speed. And do the same with this. There we go. Uh, we can also say if input get mouse button, which means that we are holding down the button instead of just pressing it like the other one. There we go. In opposition to the other one, I mean. Uh, input, not in out. There we go. Uh, then we are going to say rotation speed equal to, um, or maybe we could actually say, yeah, we could say plus equal 0.5f times time dot dot the time. I think that could actually make it a lot of fun. My bad, sorry. <laughs> I did. I forgot the minus in, in front of one of these. Uh, actually, one quite funny change would be to not have a rotation speed by, by default when the game starts. So he goes like straight up, straight forward, until the player presses once. When they press once, they start rotating. Now, if we hold down, it's going to drastically change over time, but it's not drastic enough. That's the thing. So let's say 1.5f. No, 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 hold on. That's that's the wrong one. Uh, Where's the other one? There it is. We want to say it to be 1.5f by every second. This is going to be very, very hectic, I think. Let's see. So boom, rotate, rotate, and then we hold. Yeah, it's a lot drastic. That's actually really fun. I like this. I would play this game. Would you guys not download this if it was on, uh, on uh, Play Store? I would download this completely. We're gonna go ahead and create another script inside of our scripts folders, uh, or the scripts folder, and call this camera. Um, yeah, maybe, perhaps, yeah, maybe we just call it. Exactly, it was gonna be wrong. There we go. <laughs> so we just remove this script then. We create another one and call it camera, camera follow. There we go. Uh, we just drag and drop it onto our player. Why that happened is because we already have a player or the camera script, which is the global script itself. Wait, I don't want to drag it onto our player. 
Uh, I want to drag it onto our camera. There we go, camera follow. Uh, we also want to move this this camera object out of being the child of player so that we ensure that it's not anymore a child. And um, we can actually open up the script. But as I was saying, why that happened is because we Unity always, always like includes the default camera script by default. So when you rename or name your own script to be camera, it just kind of like glitches out. Or not doesn't glitches. It doesn't glitch out, but you know, you just like, what are you doing? <laughs> There's already a script called this. So in this script, we are going to say public game object player, which is going to be the player we're gonna follow, and we can also say private vector three offset which is going to be the offset that is currently going, like the pretty much the position that the camera is going to have uh, in order to kind of just like follow the player from that kind of offset. Uh, it's going to make more sense when we get into game. So we can say avoid start. Uh, upon starting the game, aka loading the script, we are going to set the offset to be transform.position minus player.transform.position which is once again going to make sure that the, the camera starts following the player from the position that we have set in the game editor so that it doesn't like move the camera to somewhere we don't want it to move. And we're gonna have a void fixed update which is going to load uh, or run every single frame but it's not going to detect any frame loss or anything like that so it's going to run perfectly fine. And then we're gonna set the transform that position of the camera to be equal to player that transform that position plus offset. There we go. That's literally it. That's a very very simple camera kind of script you have. And in the in the inspector, we're obviously gonna. There we go. Attach the player. Now we can play, and you'll see that the camera doesn't you know like move from the beginning. And now we, the player is kind of bugging out though. Uh, I see what's the what the issue is. I am actually it's kind of weird that fixed update does this, but if you change it to only update or late update, which is also even better, um, it's it does fix that. So if you go back and play after saving the script, you're gonna see that it's now no longer like stuttering. So and you can see that this is very very cool. Without the rotation for the camera, it actually looks very solid. This is a game that I would download. I'm just saying, like this is actually something that I would play. Uh, now, as you can see, we are obviously triggering with the um, the obstacles, but we're not dying as a player, so which is wrong. Obviously, the player has to die. So we are going to go to our player script. Oh, what am I doing? There we go. <laughs> I was like, oh no, I'm gonna mess this up. I'm gonna have to re-record everything. Um, yeah, we can actually inside of our player script, we can just say void on trigger enter collider other like we did earlier in one of our other scripts, I think it was. And we, instead of this, we are going to say if other.tag equal to obstacle, then we are going to call the function die. If you guys are a part of the Discord community, you can joke about this all day long because you guys are gonna do that anyway. If you guys aren't in the Discord squad, you're, you're like, what the hell is this dude talking about? Like 40 minutes in, are you serious? Are you joking with us? But it's a meme in our Discord server <laughs> or in our community in general. So um, by the way, make sure to join. The link is in the description. Um, yeah, now we can also have a void die, which is going to just print player dead for now um, and perhaps even destroy uh, this that game object. There we go. I had like a brain fart for a second. I was like, what am I doing? Uh, contemplating life. Uh, let's see, let's see. Yeah, now we want to make sure that the obstacles get tagged as uh, obstacles. So we want to go to our prefabs folder. We want to click on the obstacle that is a prefab. Go to tag and we're going to add a new tag and click this little plus icon and name this tag obstacle. So one more time, we want to go to obstacle and now set the tag to be obstacle. So creating the tag doesn't necessarily set it to be tag. I don't know why it's made like that. I would actually wish it that it does it automatically in case you're going to a object because obviously you want to set it to be a tag, but it's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much it. We also have to make sure that the box collider is trigger. So now we can play and Kind of just try and colliding with one of these. There we go. All right, so the player dies now. 
Uh, obviously, we're getting a little error here. And we can set it to be, instead of just this, we can say if player, then we're gonna be doing doing this. Now it's gonna not throw an error because if the player is not even if the player is notified, which it becomes when we destroy the game object through the player script when we die, it's not going to throw an error because it's not gonna read this. So that is pretty much it. Um, we also want to add as a final part, I think, of this video. We're gonna end it after this, but we're gonna add a UI text here. Uh, there we go. And let's see. Oh. I forgot that the UI was this big. <laughs> All right, there we go. Uh, we want to kind of just reset it to be full with the screen. And we can move it up a little bit. We can perhaps try and aligning this in the middle. There we go. Um, that is pretty much it. And then we want to change this to uh, points. There we go. And maybe just maybe we can change the font size to 20. Mm. Yeah, the color can be can be that kind of dark space gray, I think. Uh, or maybe just make it pitch black. I think that's going to be better. I was searching for making the text. Oh, there it is. Okay, we can make it bold too. So that we have that kind of effect. Um, I also want to go to lighting settings. And uh, let's see here. Oh no, wait, it's not in here. I'm sorry. We're gonna go to camera and we're gonna change the background to be completely white. Oh, that's a little bit too much. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's better. So instead of our player script, we are going to create another variable here. Say public text um, score. Yeah, just kind of score. Or no, wait, we have a score variable. Uh, score text dump. And as you can see, we are getting a red line under text. That's because we haven't imported the library for Unity UI, which is used by the text uh, script or class. Yeah, class is a better name. And for that, we simply just say using Unity engine.ui. Literally it. Um, now in, we can actually have void uh, fixed update. And inside of this, we're gonna say score text dot get component text dot text equal to score. There we go. Uh, this is, um, oh, how about we do like this score plus. There we go. A lot better. Uh, so basically, we are saying that we are going to get the text component of our score text and we are going to set the variable text to be this. So we can go back to Unity now. Uh, we're gonna go to the player script here and attach the text here. There we go. Now it should be working. There we go. That's a lot better. One last thing before we leave, guys. Uh, we are running a giveaway right now on the channel, which is actually hosted on the Discord server. So click the link in the description or in the pinned comment to join the giveaway. It's very important because it's a 3D model pack for free, completely given out. Uh, actually, five different copies. So make sure to join. You have a huge chance of winning. So with that being said, once again, thank you so much for watching this episode. Hope you all enjoyed. Let me know any kind of feedback you have in the in the comment section down below and with that being said i'll either catch you in the comments or in the discord server see you guys peace out you, you